When I was but a wee lad, just your average Joe, sans Nuzlocke, I remember my awe playing through Pokemon Silver for the very first time, finding all these new Pokemon and forcing them to, well, you know. But as an adult, I can see that Johto has some issues. So when I learned about Pokemon GS Chronicles, a ROM hack designed to fix those very problems, and with a more in-depth story, I was intrigued. But I couldn't just enjoy it like a normal person. I had to attempt to beat it as a hardcore Nuzlocke. And not to spoil anything, but this run is way more hit and miss than my typical Nuzlocke's, so trust me, you'll want to watch the whole thing. I start off in my room, where I still have a Wii U. Apparently, my mom doesn't love me enough to get me a Switch. As I leave my house, I am not attacked by a vicious Meryl, and meet Chris instead of Lyra. Chris was the OG Johto girl anyway, so good for them bringing her back. The starters are your typical Johto ones, and I pick Cyndaquil. I can see Fire Mouse's IVs on the summary screen, and he totally sucks. No Pokemon of mine can give me a report card like that and hope it just blows over. In Cherry Grove City, this old man is as fast as ever, but since I already know how to run, he doesn't give me an old pair of shoes. North in Mr. Pokemon's house, he gives me a rare package full of new evolution stones, which is a lot more mysterious than a Pokemon egg. Before leaving, I snoop on his computer, and now I know how Fire Mouse feels in Poke School. And the answer is a... Jigglypuff seen from above. <laughs> By the way, the marts are a bit bigger than I expected, but the Poke Centers are huge. So awesome and spacey. I look at the trainer card for the first time, and doesn't boy just look so excited to be on this adventure. This passerby boy challenges me to a battle, which was expected, and Fire Mouse defeats the Water Croc easily enough. I name this boy Sylvie, not sure why he's flashing like that, and then have an unexpected battle with Chris. Here I thought she was going to show me how to catch a Pokemon. I didn't heal from the last fight, but since he's four levels higher, Fire Mouse defeats her Shinx in just a couple of tackles. Oh yeah, by the way, this game has Pokemon up to Gen 4, for now, kind of like the Johto remakes, but you have a larger variety of Pokemon to find even before the national decks. Of course, that doesn't prevent my first Pokemon from being a freaking Rattata. But at least this little mouse has guts, so that's a huge plus. Wouldn't you know, the very next Pokemon on this route is a Shinx, who I would much rather have had, to be honest. Next, I get a Ralts and change it to Day to get some better Pokemon. And I find a Talo. Welcome to the team, Moguts. In Violet City, you can apparently get a Magby in Sprout Tower, so that's who I'm hoping for. But in the end, I get a Metal Frisbee instead. He should still be useful in the gym battle. First, during this Elder battle, he swaps around his Pokemon like nobody's freaking business. It's quite frustrating, actually. But now we know how often the AI can switch. For defeating him, I get a Soothe Bell, which is great for Eevees, wink wink, and the Bright Ride. After all, in this game, HMs are once again replaced by Ride Pokemon, which is always a welcome addition. Now it's on to the first gym, Faulkner. I start with Frisbee, who resists all of this bird's attacks, because I'm trying to bait out the Murkrow in the back. It doesn't end up working, and Frisbee is sand attacked a freaking ton. As the Pidgey's about to die, he roosts right back up, so it's time to swap to Fire Mouse. His Ember deals basically the same amount that Roost heals, so it looks like we're at an impasse. Eventually though, this bird gets burned, and falls to a quick attack after getting his defense lowered. That was super lame. Next is Hoot Hoot, and I bring Frisbee back out. This bird spams Hypnosis, but also has Roost and stalls for a long time. Finally I give up, and pivot to a pre-poisoned Moguts, who can't get hypnotized, to wing attack. Last is Murkrow, who only manages a single Leer before falling to Moguts. I kept him in as a backup, because I wanted my other Pokemon to win here, but that didn't end up happening. From that battle, we learn a few things. One, I wasted several minutes of my life to this stupid roosting birds that I'll never get back. But more importantly, the Johto gym leaders actually have Johto Pokemon. That is one of my biggest qualms with the Johto region games. As I leave Violet City, Chris gives me a Pokemon egg, and then we have a coffee date in the most romantic place on Earth, the Pokemon Hospital. Until she brings up memories of her mom, who I'm guessing is dead. Way to ruin the mood there, Chris. On the way to the ruins of Alf, I encounter Team Rocket, who's upset I don't want to fund the brutalization of Pokemon. So we start a battle, and Chris comes along to make it double. I was expecting a fight against Chris here, but I guess my guide is not very clear. We chase away the rockets, and a little while later, my mysterious egg hatches into a Togepi. I guess I should have seen that coming, huh? To continue the story, I am forced to try out this puzzle that I'm pretty sure is Kabuto. 
It takes me longer than I'd care to admit to get this far, and I think I'm done, but it looks slightly off. And nothing has happened. That's better, I say as I fall into a trap door to be discovered by this scientist and Bugsy. Bugsy, apparently, has not only been unable to solve such a simple Pokemon puzzle that I did in record time, he has also failed to catch a single unknown. What exactly has he been doing here then? So he hands over the unknown report for me to do his job, and like five seconds later, I catch my first and only unknown. As I approach Union Tunnel, Chris appears again, and this time we do fight. Too bad I haven't healed my Pokemon, and the Poke Center is literally right there. At least she starts with a Ladyba, who confuses Fire Mouse, but falls to a few embers. The Vulpix has Dig, so I use this to cure Fire Mouse's confusion, switching to Dirt Bug, and after a few swaps using Leer and Scratch, one last quick attack does it. Last is her Shinx, who can't stand the heat. I was totally not ready for that fight, but I'm glad it all worked out. In Azalea Town, I encourage this old man to stand up for himself against a criminal organization, but I feel guilty that he's probably going to get himself killed, so let's help him out. I defeat a number of grunts easily enough, but again, accidentally trigger the next major battle which I am 100% not ready for. This seems to be a theme in this run. Leading with a paralyzed grass man was not the best. I swap to Frisbee, then he swaps to Magmar, so I swap again to Fire Mouse. After countless smoke screens, Magmar is eventually defeated. Out comes Buizel, who my paralyzed grass man should be able to defeat easily enough, until he brings out Nidorino again. Frisbee deals some decent damage, as Fire Mouse returns to Ember. Then, we're right back to Grass Man to defeat the Water Weasel. Again, for not being prepared, that could have gone a lot worse. After defeating Proton, Old Man Kurt and I are surrounded by the cops who almost arrest us. Until Looker, the worst undercover agent in the classified history of spies, reveals himself and lets us go free, warning us to not interfere and let the cops do their job. Which is a pretty stark departure from his handling of Team Galactic, I might add. Anyway, after narrowly avoiding being arrested by incompetent cops for the second time, I might add, I actually prepare myself and head to fight Bugsy. A burned Moguts defeats his Scorpy in a few hits, as Bugsy uses Toxic Spikes and wastes his only potion. Next is Yanma, and anticipating a Supersonic, Moguts has a Person Berry. Instead, Buggy uses U-Turn, which allows Moguts to pluck the Scyther, steal his berry, and knock him out with a Quick Attack. That went so much better than I could have hoped. I was going to use Lil Mouse as a sacrifice against Scyther, but I guess that's not necessary. Oh, and the Yanma gets one shot. This time I was prepared, and things went perfectly, even better than I had predicted. And for that, I'm ready for a Sylvie fight right here. But nothing is triggered. It's not until I get into the Ilex Forest that I find Sylvie harassing an innocent Team Rocket member. Chris pops up, so the gang's all here and she starts harassing Sylvie about him stealing a starter Pokemon. This could quickly get out of hand, so let's just start beating each other up, huh? A poisoned little mouse tries to bite this Ghastly, but ends up gnawing on this croc instead. He gets slowed down, so I bring out Moguts to pluck the swapped in Ghastly and the croc again. Last, I return to little mouse to miss a Hyperfang. I knew that would happen, but he survives with 3 HP and allows Fire Mouse to finish the job. Even though I didn't lose him, Relying on a 90% accurate Hyper Fang is not the best move. Anyway, Sylvie seems passionately against Team Rocket, almost like an obsession of some sort. Chris chases after him to get back the stolen Pokemon, and I chase after her because it seems like the thing to do. Since Chris and I are childhood friends, I already know these old farts, and they love me. So much so that they encourage Chris and I to fight, as all good grandparents do. There's a lot of rival fights in this game, huh? We both swap her to Vulpix and I to Lil Mouse. He proceeds to flinch the Vulpix with a Hyper Fang before knocking it out, and takes a pretty weak Mach Punch from Ladybug. Eevee gets lucky with a missed Hyper Fang, but then the attack drops are ignored by a crit. For her Luxio, Grassman comes out to absorb a few times for the win. She tells me that we should go visit Oak at the radio tower, but first, the old man promises me a gift, which obviously comes before everything else. This gift is a Pokemon Egg that will probably not be Togepi this time. At the entrance to Goldenrod, some guy says he lost his keys and his janitor's mask, begging me to help him. I'm a complete stranger. Why are you asking me? Then, I meet Bill in the Pokemon Center. Wait a minute. Aren't you supposed to be in Ecritique City? The Goldenrod Mart, in my opinion, is much improved. I like big marts because they sell better stuff, but always hated having to use the elevator or the stairs to get to one floor at a time. 
Well, this game does not have that issue. It's all on one screen, and it's pretty awesome. There are also new features in this underground, like a shop to maximize IVs, and a way to give Pokemon their hidden abilities. Hopefully, I can come back here once I have these items. At this point, I realize I'm playing an outdated version of this game. So I update it here, and that dramatically changes the Pokemon encounters that I can find. For example, my very next encounter is some rainbow pony, and then an awesome ice fox. Not too bad. Near the radio tower, I recall that someone said they lost their keys, so let's try to find them. I wonder where it could be. Inside the tower, my reputation precedes me, and I have a personal invite from Professor Oak. Step aside, security man. Oak is meeting with some businessmen, Asprus, and another dude who ends up being Professor Birch. Well, that's pretty cool. We're having a riveting conversation about how awesome I am, one of my favorite topics, by the way, but then Chris shows up to ruin it. Turns out, Asperus is her estranged father, whom she refuses to acknowledge. That makes things pretty awkward. Once she leaves, we can finally talk about me again. Asperus is trying to make a Johto Pokemon League that is independent from Kanto, and for some reason, Oak suggested that I participate. Don't get me wrong, I am awesome, but I only have two badges, so I'm pretty sure there are more qualified people than me. I return the brass keys, getting a mask in return, which means it's time to infiltrate the newly added Goldenrod sewers. A rocket and I play Ring Around the Garbage, which isn't as much fun as it sounds, before I once again trigger a battle I was not ready for. I was literally about to return to the Pokemon Center when this happened. I hate Proton so much. This guy swaps around like no one I have ever seen. I swear, every other turn he changes Pokemon. It's ridiculous. After dealing decent damage to all of his Pokemon, without losing any of my own, I bring out my heavy hitter, Moguts, who isn't even burned this time. A couple of plucks, quick attack, and returns later, and this bird finishes off all of Proton's Pokemon. Well, that battle was ridiculous, and I can't believe that no one died. I'm not sure what Team Rocket was doing in the sewers here, but at least I got to save Bugsy, who had been taken hostage. On my way out, Looker shows up again to scold me for not listening to him earlier. If the cops had actually done something, I wouldn't have had to. But Birch more than makes up for this jerk by offering me a Hoenn starter. In my unhumble opinion, if you consider all three starters as a whole from every generation, I think Hoenn is probably the best. And I say this as a huge Kanto fan. All three of the Hoenn guys are just so awesome. So it's a hard decision, but since I have literally no water types, it's not that hard of a decision. After picking up a moldy apple, it's time for the third gym. Now Whitney is a fairy type user in this game, which actually makes a lot of sense. Phobia starts with a sticky web, gets his attack lowered, but sludge bombs the Grand Bull while avoiding a play rough. Togetic tries to put Phobia to sleep, but I came prepared with a Chesto Berry, so no problem there. But even as a fairy user, Whitney still has a demon cow. She is just a demon fairy cow now. Anticipating a rollout, I pivot to Frisbee, who gets crit with a play rough. That was not the move I expected. Gyro Ball does not that much. I know I did hurt myself with that sticky web speed drop, but I thought it was necessary. After trading moves for a bit, she swaps to Clefairy, and I see my chance here. I pivot to Shedinja, who this Clefairy cannot hurt, forcing her to swap back to Miltank. This makes her use her only move that can hit, Rollout. But Frisbee can take those hits pretty well, and it prevents Miltank from healing too. Two Gyro Balls and one Psy Wave later, and the Frisbee does it. For her Clefairy, I decide to give Rosebud, the Roserade, a chance to kill a Fairy. Whitney may have changed her typing, but she's still a crybaby. Before heading to Ecritique, there is something vital I need to do. Participate in the Bug Catching Contest. I do this at night, because there is a chance to find a Heracross here, and end up with a Cricketune. Well, this is a bit disappointing. To add insult to injury, I win no prize, but Pantsless Riley does. This is a bit of a weird glitch, huh? I guess I need to learn how to catch better Pokemon, but this sign claims that holding down the B button does not make them easier to catch. We'll see about that. Ooh, a Creepy Lanoon, who I catch on the first try by holding down the B button. See, it does work. I hear that Chris is inside a little shrine, so naturally, I sneak up behind her during her therapy session to hear a bit more about her father's obscure secret, which she still refuses to spill. Come on, give me the deets already, man. After she leaves, this old man talks about Mega Evolution and gives me an Eevee who, to my knowledge, 
does not mega evolve, so I don't see the connection. I named this guy Esper, which obviously means he evolves into an Umbreon. I've used Espeon a lot recently, so let's give the clearly best evolution a break, huh? In the Burn Tower, I have a Sylvie battle that I was prepared for, but not well enough, apparently. You see, the Haunter falls to a Guts Boosted Bite by Little Mouse, easily enough, and then he relies on the 90% accurate Hyper Fang, which misses the Sneasel. Little Mouse tries to retreat like a scaredy rat and takes a doubled power pursuit. This marks the first death of the run, and I never thought I'd actually miss Eradicate. Farewell, my mouse friend. The rest of the fight goes well enough, with Frisbee causing his Sneasel to retreat, and Rosebud the Roserade defeating the Croconaw. Frisbee does narrowly avoid dying to a Golbat, and in every cave is somehow outsped by a Sneasel, and almost dies to an Ice Punch. So, overall, not my best fight. The legendary dogs agree, and feel ashamed for having to watch that near massacre. Good thing Lil Mouse is the only one who succumbed. After defeating his trainers, it's on to Morty, the Chosen One. Because there is heavy fog in this gym, Stinkbutt the Stunky, I let out my inner child a bit there, starts with a defog. I don't want to miss a crucial move here. After healing confusion with a Lumberry, the Mischievous falls to a Shadow Claw Curse combo. By the way, in preparation for this fight, I made the mistake of temporarily thinking that Shadow Claw was a dark move, which means I got rid of the Stab Bite for a number of my dark Pokemon in exchange for this Ghost move, which was not the best decision and I don't find out where the move learner is for quite a while yet, so I can't bring it back. For his ace, Gengar, I bring out Esper the Umbreon, who is immediately crit with a sludge bomb, and does half. Well that was not great. He heals a bit with Moonlight, before getting poisoned by some sludge, and deals only about half with an assurance. Time to swap, I suppose. Stinkbutt comes in on a heal, and almost immediately dies. She obviously won't survive another hit, but this move is doing way too much, so it's time to make a sacrifice. Goodbye, Stinkbutt. You were the epitome of class, vulgar name or no. Her death lets me bring out a poison Moguts, who should outspeed and defeat the Gengar with a pluck. Next is Marowak? This guy was not on my guide. Okay, after dealing some damage, Moguts retreats to Blink, who wastes his Kustat Berry to outspeed this Pokemon who he already outsped. That was a backup for Gengar, by the way. A few Shadow Claws takes him out. Last is Haunter, who falls to a single Shadow Claw. That was a rough fight. And it hurts putting someone else in the Deddy's box so soon. I was doing really well in this game until 5 minutes ago. I saved the Kimono Girls from this other Rocket Leader Ariana, and this time nobody dies. I know, I'm as surprised as you are. This old man then gives me a Crush Ride, so I can crush rocks just like I did to Ariana. In Olivine City, Chris confronts Sylvie again about his thieving ways, but nothing comes of it. I make my way up the tower to meet Jasmine and Amphi before being sent all the way across the ocean. The place that used to be the Safari Zone is apparently going to be the new Elite Four, where I, once again, stand right next to Chris as she airs out her daddy issues. And this time, he is right here too. Apparently, this guy paid off trainers to purposefully lose to Chris to give her an ego boost or something? I mean, that's not great, but I was expecting something with more meat. Like maybe he accidentally squashed his wife with a Snorlax or something. That would be traumatic. I have a relatively simple battle with Weesoon, where I finally realized that some of these Pokemon typings are different. Like Drowsy is a fairy, for example, and my Ariados is a ghost. Anyway, he goes down easily enough, and it's on to Chuck. Since he starts with a Heracross, I use In Every Cave to pluck this fighting bug, and he survives because of a Koba Berry. Well, my guide said nothing about that. He does fall in one more hit, and this brings out Primeape. So in every cave U turns, but is outsped and Brock slid first. Huh, does this monkey have a choice scarf maybe? He should not have been faster. But since he is, Rosebud takes a hit and heals it all back with a Giga Drain. Anticipating a heal, he then calm mines, but Giga Drain still doesn't take out the monkey. That's fine. Next turn, Rosebud is flinched, which is also still fine, and then he dies to a crit, which is not as fine. It actually sucks. Rosebud has been my go-to Pokemon for a while now. My psychic little pony scares away Primeape and gets to freely take out Hariyama. Poliwrath gets a super lucky hypnosis, but my little pony came prepared with a Lumberry. After a hyper potion, Wrath is defeated. This only leaves the super speedy Primeape. I'm confident that my pony can take a hit, but I shouldn't have been because Gunk Shot leaves her with literally one HP. That was also not in my guide. 
I did not see that coming, and I almost lost two Pokemon in a single gym. By the way, you can tell that after I made the update to this game, the guide I'm using is no longer as accurate because I'm starting to lose Pokemon left and right. After shoving some medicine down MP's throat, I am given the option of skipping all of Jasmine's trainers, which obviously I do. I feel such power just being able to walk in front of people like this. Jasmine uses the Clang type, of course, so it's a good thing I have a starter who can easily defeat steel Pokemon. Whoopies, of course. What, did you expect a fire type or something? He starts with a power-up punch to break Magneton sturdy, but Jasmine swaps to Steelix instead, which has the same effect. A few stomping tantrums later, and protects, Steelix goes down as Whoopies heals with some leftovers. Magneton gets healed a few times, which is fine because it gives Whoopies some more attack boosts. With plus three attack, Lairon and Bassadon stand no chance. That was way easier than I anticipated, but I'm not complaining. What a great debut fight for Whoopie Boy. As soon as I leave the gym, Bugsy gives me a call and demands that I use my big brain strats to help him solve another unknown puzzle. After the cakewalk we just had, how hard can it be? Oh yeah, and we meet Cynthia here too. That's cool. Turns out, I may be a Pokemon master in training, but I apparently don't know what Omanyte is supposed to look like. I'm good at knowing how he doesn't look because this is not an Omanyte, but it takes a while to fix him. Elm also calls me out of the blue, why does everyone think I want to talk all of a sudden, and explains that the rare package I got at the start was actually a keystone used for mega evolutions. This sends me back to Chris's therapist who does what all good doctors do, force their patients to fight each other for a single resource. As always, Chris starts with Ledian and immediately swaps to Matang on a pluck. So I swap to Joker to one shot with Darkest Lariat. Joker retreats from a brick break that in every cave can tank, and she finishes what she tried at the start. Whoopies comes out to get swaggered by Luxray, who swaps to Miss Magius to avoid the move anyway. Good play. Joker comes back out on a psychic to one shot with another dark move. Threatened by the fairy type now, she retreats again to bring out Frisbee, who does very little with Gyro Ball. Why do I keep thinking this move will actually do some damage? Chris swaps to Ninetales, so I bring out Whoopies again, as this fox uses a freaking energy ball. But he survives with 11 HP and throws a tantrum to defeat Ninetales. As much as I'd like to blame the guide for that horrific mistake, it was totally on me this time. It's on there. I just missed it. For the Luxray, Fire Mouse comes out to Earth Power, that doesn't quite do it, and he is swaggered. My Little Pony pops out on a heal, and Psychic is not very effective, because Luxray is now a Psychic type? Huh. I would have given him Dark as a second typing if anything. After a single hit, she too is swaggered. I hate this guy so much, but finally, Fire Mouse returns to Earth Power one more time. Last is Sylveon, who in every cave can Sludge Bomb down pretty easily. With that, I am the proud new owner of a Mega Pendant. I head to the ruins of Alf just to smash some rocks until I get an old Amber. I do this because I had previously found a special item only Aerodactyl can use, but more on that later. For now, on the way to the Lake of Rage, I meet up with Lorelei, who is my favorite Kanto Elite Four member, because she's pretty awesome. Then again, Lance does hyperbeam this guy, giving her a run for her money. I infiltrate the rocket hideout and have a number of unimportant battles. After getting the door code, which is stupid long by the way, I easily defeat Petrol and get to the final battle of this hideout, a double battle with Lance, who was dressed like Archie, apparently. We both start with identical pterodactyls until mine mega evolves. Lance and I spam Earthquake and Rock Slide, and we've got a good thing going until he ruins the party by swapping in a Charizard. Come on, man, we were tarot buddies. Then again, upon seeing a Manetric, I run away too. There's no reason to risk him now, is there? Anyway, Charizard easily finishes off the battle, and I have defeated Team Rocket once again. With that, I head to the gym, only to discover that Old Man Price is about to croak, so they brought in newer and much more attractive blood. That may be age discrimination, but I'm okay with it. Perhaps I shouldn't have been, because Lorelei is way tougher than I gave her credit for. I decide to start with Artix, who plans on healing with Draining Kiss, until Lorelei swaps to a Steel Sand Slash. That Pokemon was not on the gym guide, by the way. Expecting a steel move, I swap to Fire Mouse on a Smart Strike, and Lorelei allows him to flamethrower the Ice Steel Shrew. This obviously brings out her Lapras, who is going to be a pain. Frisbee, who is no longer a Frisbee, should be able to tank some hits and deal some damage, unless he's immediately burned. 
Well, that's great. He is then crit, which is also great, and sets up stealth rocks. The plan was to deal enough damage that I could swap out here, but things just don't seem to be going my way. He stays in, hoping for a low roll or something, and doesn't get it. Maybe I could have gotten away with not sacrificing Frisbee here, but I'm not sure. I bring Artix back out, hoping that Dazzling Gleam will take out the Lapras, and it doesn't. But she does get fully healed by a Draining Kiss, so that's nice. Out comes Mr. Rhyme, another Pokemon who is not in my guide. Fun. Somehow, this guy outspeeds my very swift Artix, so maybe he has a Choice Scarf? The Jinx he seemingly replaced did have a Choice Scarf. So going with that assumption, I swap to Joker on a Psyshock, who is promptly hit by a Dazzling Gleam that almost kills her. After Life Orb and Burn Damage, she is left with a whopping 2 HP. I really don't understand how Mr. Rhyme outsped without a Choice Scarf, because he's not that fast a Pokemon. Okay, I swap to Fire Mouse on the Frostlass's Water Pulse, which was not a great move on my part, but at least he has a Choice Scarf, so he outspeeds with a Flamethrower. The Glaceon also falls to a Flamethrower. Okay, that was rough. Not only did I lose Frisbee, who has been my go-to tank this whole run, but I probably should have lost Joker and Fire Mouse too. Overall, that was a bad gem. It's at this point I finally explore the Pokemon Center and discover that this lady up here has been a move reminder the entire time. It may not seem like a big deal, but if I had known about this, some fights would have been way easier. Also, in the old souvenir shop, Granny sells ability pills and patches, which are incredible if only I could afford them. They are really expensive. Looker calls me in a compromising position to talk about some nonsense going on with Team Rocket. First, you want me to stay away, and now you tell me the details of an ongoing investigation? Make up your mind. I get through Ice Path and immediately have to fight Chris. As always, there's a lot of swapping going on, and somehow my Mega Aerodactyl is outsped by some ghost and nearly dies. Not sure how that happened, but overall, this battle goes decently well. Nobody dies, and that's what matters. But Chris doesn't even give me time to gloat, as she immediately flies away. What the heck? Looker calls me again to tell me that Mr. Asparagus, Chris's father, has been kidnapped by Team Rocket. Alright, time to head to Goldenrod, I suppose. A surprise was waiting for me there, in the form of Team Rocket Nurse Joy, who charges me $50 to heal my Pokemon. And, for some reason, I actually trust him to give my Pokemon back. Which he does. This companion Rocket apparently wants to work in a hospital and make money at the same time. Back home, we call that being a doctor. After being viciously insulted one times too many, I put a stop to this. Looker and I break into the radio tower, but he is nowhere to be seen on the inside. Well, that's weird. Instead, Silver and I have a double battle and beat up some Rockets. Now, there are a ton of Rocket fights here that I don't want to show, except for this one, for no particular reason. You see, Taro defeats a Zangoose easily enough, and I foolishly think that an Earthquake will take out this Golem, which it does not, and then a Rock Blast takes out my Taro. I probably could have Mega Evolved to save him, but I'm trying to not use that all over the place. Anyway, that death sucks, because it was not only avoidable, but also against a stupid random Rocket Grunt. It wasn't even a major battle. Turo's funeral takes priority over some kidnapped dude, so I drop everything and give him a proper send-off. Goodbye, my friend. I had grand visions of Mega Evolving you in the Elite Four. Returning to the tower, there is a major battle with Burkle next, but he is not all that difficult, so let's just skip him. He gives me an old key, letting me get into the real underground, where Sylvie is shaking down a rocket grunt. This fight I actually will show, because it's super fast. It consists of a Moguts who is burned with a life orb, facade sweeping his whole team. That's literally all there is to it. The only way to power him up more would be if he had a choice band. To say that Sylvie was stunned by his unmitigated defeat would be an understatement. Chris and I save her dad, who is actually not her dad, it's just a rocket guy petrol. The Smeargle goes down in a few hits, but does leech seed my little pony. The Weezing comes out and apparently has a papaya berry, which wasn't in my guide, which lets him survive the hit and crit sludge bomb my little pony. Dang it, these rockets are not being fair. I do sweep the rest of his team, but my heart really isn't in it anymore. Not after another death at the hand of loser rockets. This leads us to the fight with Proton. After Pinsir falls to a flamethrower, I totally expected a switch, Whoopies comes out against the Aggron to get a few power-up punches. With leftovers and protect to keep him healed, he then proceeds to blow through Proton's team. 
Why couldn't all the rockets be that predictable and easy? Ariana is guarding the very last door, so we're almost done with these rockets once and for all. I tried to do a similar power-up punch sweep with Electivire, but even with plus one attack, Nidoqueen survives an earthquake and Toxic's Electabug, so that was short-lived. Aside from that, this battle goes well enough, with my two starters clearing out her Pokemon. I will admit, I was surprised at the very end how much Honkrow's Hurricane did to Whoopies, because that was close, but he survives. After defeating her, all of the other Rocket guys I've already defeated show back up to have a 4 vs 1 battle. Alright, I'm down, maybe this will make it a fair fight. Until some gym leaders show up to ruin my fun. And while I appreciate their support, these are all the first 4 gym leaders, meaning their Pokemon were all under level 30. So how exactly do they plan on winning here? In spite of all that, Morty tells me to fly away to Ecritique City to enjoy a night at the theater. Why not? I could use a break. But the break was a lie. It was all an elaborate ruse to get me to beat up this old guy. In reality, he wants to test me to see if I'm worthy of holding a Mega Evolution Stone. But I defeat most of his Pokemon with my two Guts users. I love these guys. Even beating his Mega Sableye, who heals a freaking ton. For his last Pokemon, Whoopies comes out to Earthquake the Sylveon. Not too bad. My reward ends up being a freaking Typhlosionite. Now I knew this was coming, because my guide told me about this item, but I have no idea what Mega Typhlosion looks like or what type he is. So let's find out together. After Claire insults my Keystone wearing self, she is literally the worst. At the top of the tower, the gym leaders apparently miss the most important rocket leader, Archie. And as bad guys tend to do, he starts monologuing. Project Renaissance was a way to force Pokemon to evolve via radio waves. This includes apparently Mega Evolution. Sylvia appears to berate Archie, and then stands to the side to watch our battle. I obviously lead with Fire Mouse, and realize that Yan Mega is now a freaking Dragon type, so Flamethrower probably won't do it. Instead, Fire Mouse Mega evolves to Flame Charge, and almost dies to a Dragon Pulse, getting a Berserk boost in the process. This Mega Evolved Typhlosion is called Feraligator, for some reason, and he becomes a Ground type. His ability gives him a special attack boost when his health is below half. Flamethrower now does take out this dragon bug, baiting out a Dusknor. Now this guy has a muscle band shadow sneak that I don't want to risk, so out comes Esper the Umbreon to take the hit. Anticipating a swap, I use Knockout that doesn't do anything to Houndoom. This girl also mega evolves and sets up the sun, activating solar power. I don't have any good swaps here, so I leave Esper in as Archie pivots to Gliscor for some reason. A sun-boosted, solar-powered flamethrower would certainly have done a ton to Esper, so why did he change? Gliscor has Swords Dance that he oh so generously uses, meaning that Foul Play, which does more damage based on my opponent's attack, does a decent amount. Gliscor tries to heal a few times and hits a facade, but to no avail. The Skarmory does a decent amount with Brave Bird, but Esper can heal it all back with a Moonlight. And once I realize this bird has weak armor, I just gotta keep smacking him with his own wings until he falls. This brings Houndoom back out. I'm assuming that this demon dog still doesn't see a move that can immediately take me out, so I'm hoping for another sunny day. I pivot back to Fire Mouse, and it worked perfectly. Archer tries to heal the dog, but an Earth Power makes that pointless. I once again swap on the Dusknor, this time to Joker, who takes it out in two hits. Last is Spiritomb, who also falls in two hits. That was a bit of a long battle, but Esper the Umbreon really came in clutch right when I needed him. He probably would have fallen if Archer had been smart with Houndoom, but I'm glad he wasn't. After successfully defeating Team Rocket for the last time, Looker appears to take all of the glory for my victory. What a jerk. The only problem is, downstairs, the real Looker says he just woke up from being unconscious. So the fake Looker was the Rocket guy who likes disguises. And now, they're already all free. That was the fastest prison break ever. But I won't just sit here and cry, because there are more important things to do, like the Pokemon League, meaning we need to get our last gym badge against Claire. I plan to have Arctix, the Ninetales, do this fight all on their own if possible. The Dragonair falls to a single Ice Beam, and the Gyarados Mega Evolves. Dazzling Gleam doesn't even come close, and she Dragon Dances. But I'm not scared, because Arctix came prepared. She takes an Aqua Tail, hangs on thanks to a Focus Sash, and uses one last Dazzle and Gleam. Well, her scariest Pokemon is now gone. Flygon should fall to a 4x Ice Beam, unless he outspeeds and does a whopping 1 damage. 
I have a pretty fast Arctix, so I could have sworn she was faster than some antlion. That sucks. Because again, she is another Pokemon I was hoping to bring to the Elite Four. Joker dodges a Dragon Rush and one-shots with a Facade. The Altaria is also Facaded, but the Kingdra still kinda scares me, so let's give it to Esper. This part takes a long time because Foul Play is not that strong, but Esper stays healthy with some Moonlight and the Kingdra heals. At one point Esper is crit, but I was being careful with healing, so he survives it with 14 HP. And eventually, the Kingdra does hit herself into Oblivion. Claire naturally refuses to admit defeat because she is truly a Karen. In the Dragon's Den, this Elder asks some super simple questions, so I have no idea how Claire hasn't passed this thing yet. It's not until the Elder threatens to tattle to Claire's cousin that she finally gives me the badge. At the same time, the Elder gives me a perfect IV shiny Dratini with extreme speed. So that's cool. As I prepare to get a few last encounters, I immediately find a Raikou, which sucks because I am like 5 minutes away from getting a Master Ball. So this was a wasted encounter. Let's just throw an Ultra Ball and see what happens. And somehow, I catch him. Well alright. Right after that, Elm gives me a Master Ball that I apparently don't need, and tells me to go defeat the Kimono Girls, something that Sylvie couldn't even do. In these games, you still face these girls one after another, but they all start with a Knock Towel before getting into the actually good Pokemon. Facading Moguts takes out most of the evolutions, with a few pivots just to make sure he doesn't get hit. After getting the Rainbow Wing, I make my way up this maze of a tower, where the Kimono Girl's horrible dancing attracts the legendary bird, Ho-Oh. I attempt to replicate my Raikou encounter, but to no avail. Alright, Master Ball it is. Finally, it's time for Victory Road, the last leg of my Pokemon journey. Mr. Asparagus meets me at the entrance to wish me luck. I don't think he's supposed to play favorites like that. Before even getting to Victory Road, Cynthia appears but thankfully does not want to battle. I honestly don't know if I could handle that right now. I pass through the badge gates and now enter Victory Road. I guess the past 30 minutes was just a preamble or something? Things are going well enough until I glitch out the game and end up walking on water. Being Chris Angel is cool at first until I realize I can't leave the water I can't even go back up a waterfall. That's fine, I can always just fly away. Or not. The escape rope though does end up saving me from being softlocked. Can you imagine being trapped at the very end of the game, being unable to finish it? That would suck. Old Man Price has been training at the Victory Road exit and he is surprised that I have his badge. Well, yeah, you called in sick. He wants to see if I'm worthy because he doesn't trust Lorelei's judgment. Electabug starts with a power-up punch on the Dugong, before a Thunder Punch knocks it out. Weavile obviously goes first to hit a Triple Axel that knocks her right out. I uh, don't know what I expected there, but I was hoping to not lose Electabug. Oh well. Weevil does have a Choice Band, which is why it was so powerful, so that was poor planning on my part. Fire Mouse comes out to Flamethrower the Walrein, who obviously has thick fat. Esper comes out on a Toxic, but even with a Moonlight, it's obvious that this Walrus has the advantage especially since he heals the poison away. I bring out Joker on an Ice Gem powered Blizzard, which wasn't great, but she still knocks him out with Facade. Weavile is much too fast, so Jaws comes out and is promptly low kicked. Didn't realize sharks were so heavy. Since Weavile has a choice band, he's now stuck with low kick, so Wally mega evolves and dazzling gleams. Fire Mouse is brought in as his Abomasnow mega evolves and falls to a four times effective flamethrower. This puts him in the perfect position to Choice Specs Flamethrower the Mamoswine, who survives the hit and Psychic Fangs my starter. And he dies. That was mighty disappointing. Apparently, that Mamoswine has his hidden ability Thick Fat, because that's the only way he could have survived that hit. Wally then comes back out to win the battle. With that last obstacle out of my way, I get to the Pokemon League, which is a bittersweet moment. Sweet, because all of the profs are here to wish me luck and Birch gives me the Hoenn Starter Mega Evolution Stones, which is greatly appreciated, but bitter because of how many great Pokemon I now have to leave in the box. I could have made a solid Elite Four team out of just these dead Pokemon. Goodbye Mega Typhlosion, I hardly knew ye. As I'm doing some last minute preparations, I run into Entei, but don't get as lucky as I did with Raikou. Oh well, after forming my team of Pokemon you've mostly already seen, I enter the Elite Four. This one takes after the gens where you can choose the Elite Four order, so I'm assuming the Pokeball colors indicate the type of trainer. 
Let's just start with Karen on the far right. She leads with Umbreon, and I with Phobia the Ariados. Haven't seen him in a while. He needs to use Sticky Web to slow down Karen's Pokemon and get toxic because, again, he is a ghost in this game, not poison. Bug Bite does some damage, Foul Play is lessened by a Culverberry, and I swap into Joker on a few Protects to knock him out with Facade. The Shift Tree has a Choice Scarf, but with that Sticky Web, Joker will still outspeed. Same with the Drapion and the Houndoom. I'm surprised she waited for her Tyranitar till the end here. I don't know how this happens, but when she Mega Evolves it, it goes from level 60 to 64, which is above the level cap. What a cheater. A 4x Brick Break is not enough to take out the Megazord, but Stone Edge almost one-shots Joker. That was not a great plan on my part. Let's just blame the extra 4 levels, huh? I bring out Whoopies, the Swampert on a full restore, and after a few Brick Breaks and healings, Tyranitar does fall. That fight actually went decently well. I don't know how to pronounce this one, but Aeol is the next Elite Four member, and she uses normal types. Starting with Ursaring, who Moguts takes out with a single Life Orb facade. Delcaddy has a Fake Out, and is buffed in this game, so she's pretty strong, so out comes Phobia to once again, Sticky Web, on the Snorlax apparently. I swap to Esper the Umbreon on a Darkest Lariat to Foul Play the Snorlax. He starts using Curse, but Foul Play still does the same amount, because it's based on Snorlax's attack. He stays healthy with full restores, and I with Moonlight, until eventually, Snorlax gets scared and runs away. What a waste of time that was. I decide to swap two into Whoopies on a Fake Out, take a Sucker Punch, and use my own Power Up Punch. Anticipating a Toxic here, Joker comes back out on the Blissey to Facade. The Snorlax is Facaded too. Last is Mega Kangaskhan with a Fake Out that Phobia avoids, and I decide to stay in to use a Sludge Bomb that actually poisons the Kangaskhan. That was a close one for sure. With that, I bring Joker back out as I use a Mega Ribbon, and she blocks a Pokeball or something? I have no idea what just happened there, but I'll take it. This lets Joker get a free hit, and after a heal, he one-shots the Kangaskhan anyway. Maybe I made that more difficult than it had to be. Oh well. On to the next room is Koga. I don't know how the Johto Elite Four managed to poach two Kanto Elite Four members, but it is what it is. Mogut starts the fight with a Pluck that Life Orb Roserade avoids, sacrificing a Gengar instead. I'll take the trade. Crobat might outspeed, so Joker comes in to tank a Brave Bird, and Choice Scarf facade that bat. Extreme Speed might have worked as well. Phobia takes a Roserade's Giga Drain, and once again sets up a Sticky Web as Roserade uses Toxic Spikes. Not sure if that was worth it now. Out comes Wally the Gardevoir to Mega Evolve and Psychic the Roserade. For the Muck, a Psychic should take him out too, and it does not. But a Gunk Shot obviously takes away Wally, because that's just how it goes. Lame. Alright, Mo Guts, let's finish this up with Facades. Normally, Mega Beedrill would totally outspeed, but since Beedrill is not flying type, he gets caught in the web and never gets a chance to attack. Not gonna lie though, Mega Beedrill is pretty scary. It was a risk using a fairy Pokemon against the Poison Leader, but I thought that Wally could do it. That was disappointing. The last Elite Four member is Will, so I guess they poached three of the Elite Four. What happened to Bruno? Once again, I leave with no guts to facade the Rocky Helmet Zatu. Bit of a weird item choice, actually. Phobia comes out to whittle away at the Bronzon, who instead chooses to blow up, doing absolutely nothing. Alright, this battle is going great so far. Mega Gardevoir burns Phobia with a Will-O-Wisp and survives the Shadow Ball. After a few full restores, he still has one left, so I pivot to Joker, expecting a heal, and he is instead Fairy-type Hyper-Voiced right in the face. That really sucked. Whoopies goes for an Earthquake that the Executor tanks. Whoopies takes a Giga Drain, baiting out Psychic for Esper to avoid. After using Trick Room, Executor swaps with Slowking, who calm minds a bunch of times, but doesn't really do anything else. Oh, and now he heals? Why heal this thing instead of the Mega Gardevoir? What a jerk. Speaking of, Gardevoir comes out after the Slow King, and Esper just happens to still have Quick Attack. That was super lucky. And then Executor falls next. Esper has been carrying this team in several of these battles. He is doing a fantastic job. After defeating all of the Elite Four members, I enter the Champion Hall, where the final battle between me and Chris will begin. Let's see who is the first Johto Champion. Psych! 
Sylvie comes out of nowhere and demands a battle against me first. Which is not great, but I can't deny it. Since Chris has a fairly high level cap, I was able to jump up a bit. Phobia starts with a focus sash and uses sticky web because that's all he's good for. As Sylvie swaps to Crobat, Esper comes out on double teams, which isn't great. He spams it six times before then swapping into Weavile for some reason. I could have lost the run right there if he wasn't an idiot. Esper manages to stay healthy with Moonlight against the Weavile and defeats him after a few heals. I don't want a repeat of last Crobat, so Moguts takes a cross poison and facades in return. Esper returns on the focus sashed Alakazam, which is why Moguts had to run away. After a single hit though, Electivire comes in. Whoopies comes out to Mega Evolve and then Earthquake. Now this Feraligator has a Feraligatorite, but I have no idea what type he's going to be. Let's just hope it's not flying. And he ends up being a dragon, gets a super clutch crit, and lowers my Whoopi's speed. So it's time to swap. Esper the tank never gets a chance to attack because he too is immediately crit. Well dang it. Phobia does finally knock out the Mega Feraligator with two Shadow Balls and the Alakazam too. This puts Phobia in a great spot to also Shadow Ball the Gengar. After his defeat, Sylvie admits that he stole the Pokemon and a ton of other things too. But Elm decides to let him keep Feraligator because Mega Evolution is only possible if you love your Pokemon. Anyway, once he leaves, I hope I get a chance to prepare my team for the last battle, and I don't. Which sucks for two reasons. One, it means that Phobia is still in front, even though I would have wanted Moguts. And the second reason it sucks, which is more relevant, will be clear shortly. After using Sticky Web, Phobia tries to sludge bomb the now fairy type Melotic, but between Aqua Ring, Leftovers, and Recover, he is failing miserably. I decide to sack him to bring out the very healthy Moguts. Without Guts, this bird is really not that great. Return can't even take out Melotic, and Chris swaps to Mischievous anyway. He tries to U-turn for some chip, but is power gemmed instead. My last Pokemon is Whoopies, who can hopefully do this battle all on his own. Unless he's immediately burned, cutting his attack in half. Okay, the writing is on the wall at this point, let's just get it over with. Sunflora misses the first hit, but Seed Flares the second, and it's a crit too, because why not? Alright, that's it. I officially lost Pokemon GS Chronicles at the very last battle. It wasn't even particularly close either. I'd like to tell myself it's because I didn't get a chance to prepare, and was slightly underleveled, but the truth is, I just lost too many Pokemon on the way to the champion. Maybe if Esper had survived, I could have done it. Oh well, that's it. As much as I like this game, I don't really want to play through the whole thing again. So, let's just call it... Actually no, let's make a new team and try the Elite Four again. This time, all bets are off and I can use any Pokemon I want, including Legendaries. Now you might argue that Ho-Oh at 63 is above the level cap of 60. But remember that Karen cheated to get a 64 Mega Tyranitar, so I can cheat too. The seriousness of this run has kind of gone out the window. I just want to win at this point. Uh oh, starts with a Drill Peck, heals the Umbreon's Toxic, and Drill Pecks the Tyranitar. A Aeron comes out to avoid a hit, Mega Evolves, and these two Titans trade hits back and forth. Once the Sandstorm subsides, I bring out Elliot, the Shiny Dragonite, on a heal. That's too bad. Tyranitar misses Stone Edge, Elliot does have a Focus Sash, so it wouldn't have been the end of the world, and then takes him out in two Brick Breaks. Drapion survives an Earthquake, and anticipating a heal, Elliot goes for Dragon Dance. I told you the seriousness here is gone. Earthquake now takes him out, and Umbreon falls to a Brick Break. The Choice Scarf Shift Tree might outspeed, so I bring out Mega Aaron to lock him into a weak Rock Slide, and Heavy Slam the tree after being flinched. Uh-oh comes out on a Houndoom's Heat Wave to one-shot with a Drill Peck. That wasn't so bad, Karen. I'm doing the same order as last time because why not? Next is the normal types. I start with Lucky Boy, the Raikou, against Ursaring. He uses Calm Mind, survives a close combat, and would have taken her out with Aura Sphere if she didn't run away. But that's okay, because this stupid Blissey loves to use Heal Bell to cure the Ursaring's burn, even though he wants to be burned. This lets Elliot come out for free, Dragon Dance on a Soft Boiled, Power Up Punch, and Heal a Toxic, 
and then use a Brick Brick. The Snorlax might survive a Brick, so let's go for another Power Up Punch first. The Ursa Ring is back out, and then gone again. Delcaddy does hit pretty hard with Fake Out, and a Sucker Punch, but we're still all good. Kangaskhan has Fake Out, so Aaron takes the hit, Mega Evolves again, and Metal Burst the Seismic Toss, doing not that much damage. Oh well. Out comes Gengar on another toss to Choice Spec Sludge Bomb this Kangaskhan. We haven't lost anyone yet, but that didn't start last time until the Koga battle, so here's hoping it goes better. Uh oh, Choice Scarf Drill pecks the Roserade. I was expecting a swap there to be honest. This brings out Crobat, who misses an attack and after several Drill pecks, goes down. Aaron avoids the Mux Toxic, and even with Minimize and several heals, Earthquakes the Slime. Mega Beedrill is not slowed down this time, and I'm expecting him to hit a pretty hard drill run that did 40 whole damage. Aaron, on the other hand, squashes him like the bug he is. Gengar's Shadow Ball does some damage, but not enough to win. We're already doing so much better than last time. Things are looking up. With that, we're on to the last Elite Four member. I used Too Good for the first time here to Dragon Dance, heal with Leftovers, Crunch, and get a Moxie Attack Boost. You see, the secret to my success here, aside from having OP Pokemon, is that after my first Elite Four attempt, I had enough money to buy a few ability patches, giving Aaron, Elliot, and Too Good their hidden abilities. And so, with Too Good's Moxie Boost, making him even gooder, if that's a word, he was gonna decimate Will's team. But the Slow King somehow survived. Well, that's weird. And he does it again. Don't ruin this for me, come on. After another failed attempt, Will swaps into Bronzong to give Too Good another free attack boost. That was mighty kind. One Executor later, and Slow King does fall in a single crunch. And the Mega Gardevoir falls to a return. Alright, we're back at the champion battles. Can I win this time? The answer is no, unfortunately. Not because I lose, but because I get freaking soft locked. After beating Will, I save the game to take a break, and when I load it back up, every single door is locked. I can't move forward to the Champion Hall, and I can't go anywhere else either. I even tried to fly away or use escape ropes to no avail. So I guess for real, the run is over. There's nothing I can do here because I already saved and I can't leave. And again, I really don't feel like starting all over from the beginning. So for the second time, I failed to become the first Johto Champion. Unless I purposefully corrupt my save file, something I did on accident towards the very start of this game. This forces the game to load my previous save file where I'm back in Goldenrod changing my Pokemon's natures before the Elite Four. And so, for the third and hopefully last time, I begin the Elite Four challenge. There is one major difference this time though. All of my Pokemon are invisible in the summary screen. That's what happens when you mess with corrupt files. I'm not going to bore you with the same battles a third time, because I didn't even want to play them, so I doubt you want to watch them. For some battles, I use the same strat as last time, and for others, I mix it up. I kind of feel like an expert now, playing through the section of the game three times in a row in as many days. After trouncing Will, and having lost no Pokemon, I go straight to the Hall of the Champion and begin the Sylvie fight. I leave with Uh-Oh, who baits out an Icicle Crash that Aaron shrugs off. He Mega Evolves, of course, to Stealth Rocks the Feraligator, hits with a few Earthquakes, but is Screeched. Elliot takes an Aqua Tail, heals with Leftovers, and uses Dragon Claw. Weavile comes back out, so Aaron does too, for the Electivire to get Heavy Slammed. He Wild Charges Lucky Boy, who Choice Specs Shadow Ball's Electivire. It also does a decent amount to Crobat, but I don't want to deal with these double teams. Too Good uses a single Dragon Dance, and then Crunch thankfully hits but fails to knock out the bat. After missing a return and getting crit and poisoned in return, Too Good is not living up to his namesake. Aaron avoids a cross poison and immediately heavy slams the bat. Good job being so fat, Aaron. Uh oh is a pretty good special defensive tank, so he makes a return to one shot the Gengar. With Choice Specs, he outspeeds the Weavile to take him out too. And the Alakazam's Focus Sash is broken by Stealth Rocks, so I beat Sylvie for the second time without losing a single Pokemon. But this leaves the most difficult battle of them all, Chris. And this time, I don't know entirely what's coming. Uh-oh outspeeds and one-shots the Ledian 
even with an Oka Berry. My guy didn't say anything about a Luxray, and I never got far enough to see him last time, so I'm a bit surprised. Even more so when he Mega Evolves. I didn't see that coming. Luxray is a Psychic type, so it's a good thing Lucky Boy still has Shadow Ball, that he never gets to use because of a crit. Dang it. This guy is apparently really fast, so out comes Uh-Oh with his Choice Scarf, to not one-shot, and then he himself is one-shot. At least, the recoil damage from Wild Charge finishes the job. I swear though, if I lose this battle again, I will quit Pokemon forever. Which I'm sure you guys would all like, you haters. I send out Elliot and Chris Melotic. Because this guy is a fairy now, OG Ghost comes out to Mega Evolve for the first time and still fails to one-shot with a Sludge Bomb. What the heck, man? After some healing, Melotic does fall. Her Ninetales baits out Elliot on an Overheat, who Dragon Dances, and Earthquakes. Sunflora survives a Dragon Claw, but fails to Leech Seed. And her last Pokemon is a Mismagius, who falls to a Dragon Claw. And so, after three Elite Four attempts, I am officially the first Johto Champion and the best trainer ever. If you ignore my previous losses. Elm takes me to the Hall of Fame, where my very fair and not at all stacked team will be recorded for all of history. It seems somewhat fitting that in the last battle, the two legendaries I brought didn't make it, because I typically don't use legendaries in runs. But I got frustrated after the first attempt, so apparently my morals are not very well defined. All in all, I thought this game was very well done. If you like Johto, but aren't a fan of the level caps, or the gym leaders having too many Kanto Pokemon, then this is the game for you. Now I'll admit, there are a few bugs here and there, the worst being the soft lock that I had, but I did end up playing the newest version, which, at the time of my playthrough several months ago, was a new update, so there were bound to be some issues. Nothing game-breaking, besides the one that did break the game. Regardless, I still had a great time playing this ROM hack, and if you want to try out Pokemon GS Chronicles, I've included the Discord server link in the video description. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next region.